So I'll give you the example of Kimball Musk. I, I hire Kimball out of third year university at Queens. He's now going to be running a franchise. I'm training him how to run a franchise. So how do I make Kimball do more? I sat down with him and I said, how much money do you want to make this summer? He said, I don't know, 15,000. And I said, what would your life be like if you made 20? He's like, Pfft. If I made $20,000 in 1993, I got him to set his goal at 20,000, but he's like, I don't know how to do that. And I said, well, if I showed you how many clients you needed to do and how much revenue and where to find the client. So we, we took the profit number and then we backed that into a plan. And then I just helped coach him on executing the plan. But I started yes. with a goal that was his. The goal was money. How much money does he want to make? Instead of motivating people, I hire self-motivated people and I find what carrots matter to them, and then I just help reverse engineer that. Hey legend, in this episode, we talked to an amazing man by the name of Cameron Harold. 21 years old, he's already got 14 employees. 35 years old, he's already taken two companies to 100 million plus. And by 42, he had taken 1-800-GOT-JUNK with his partner from $2 million up to $106 million and over 3,000 employees. This guy walks the walk and he talks the talk. He's been paid to speak on every single continent on earth, including Antarctica, which is insane. And he shares with us how to improve our leadership skills, how we can connect more with our teams, not just our teams in our businesses, but in the lives of the people around us. And really it's coming from the heart and mind of a guy who has actually done these things at a huge scale and really connected with people in small companies all the way up to really large companies. And everything he touches comes into the top three best rated places to work all around the world. He's done this in Australia, he's done this in Canada, he's done this in the US. So really looking forward to sharing this episode with you. And it's really worth figuring out what the difference he shares about a bucket list and a fuck it list. Enjoy. Cam, what a pleasure. Glad we got to have this little chat and figure out that we'd both been in Medellin recently <laughs> and, and ready to rock and roll, different circumstances. That's crazy, good to see you. Yeah, it's crazy <laughs> that I was literally in Medellin a week and a half ago and you're there right now. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. Um, man, so, Love to know, first off, I know, you know, you're in a different phase of life, but what, what's your reputation, would you say? What, what are you well known for? Wow. I used to be really well known for helping entrepreneurs grow fantastic company cultures. Mm -hmm. um, I'd worked with, with companies all over the world to help them grow into the best companies to work for. In fact, I coached two companies in Australia, where you're from, go on to become number one to work for in Australia. I coached Naomi Simpson, who went on to become, she's on Shark Tank from Red Balloon Days. I coached another guy uh, who built the Physio Co, Tristan White, to become number one in Australia. I coached another guy who built Thinky Eye to become number one in Australia. So I, I did that multiple times in multiple countries around how to build a world-class company culture. And then around six or seven years ago, I think I got tired of just talking about culture and um, really recognized that there was a massive niche for a community for second in commands where there were all these groups for entrepreneurs and for entrepreneurial people but there was nowhere for that coo to go and grow so i really i think i've become much more known now around that second in command if anyone mentions the term or the title chief operating officer my name comes up in the conversation very quickly yeah definitely and would you be able to break that apart really quickly for us like you know, they're, they're very different personalities. And like you said, sometimes they get lumped in as the same. Mm. What would you say the kind of main differences between a CEO and a COO are? It's almost like a, a man and a woman. You know, men are not hairy versions of women. We see the world differently. We think differently. We react differently. We problem solve differently. We have different, different spatial awareness. We have different levels of intuition that we work with. And um, we're just different, right? We're similar, but we're different. The CEO or the entrepreneur tends to be very vision. They tend to be very future thinking. They tend to start projects very, very quickly and plan later. The COOs tend to be the who, what, when, where, why, and how of everything. They tend to think through everything before they start and initiate. They don't tend to have as many visionary ideas, but they tend to be able to understand how to make those ideas come true. Oftentimes, the COO is the brakes to the entrepreneur's gas, or we're the leash to the entrepreneur's dragon. Um, but we we also we almost like the yin and yang, where we really are that perfect partnership with the CEO, mm -hmm. more than almost anyone else in the COO team. Yeah, and 
how does this relate? Because we've really been talking about how you know team sizes have been shrinking a lot. You know, mm. with, with how virtual we've gone. How important is this to understand at the start phases of a company? And when you're maybe you're in a small business that gets to five or max five to ten people. What what ends up being really critical is that second in command has to be probably the best in the organization at actually dealing with all the people issues. So mm -hmm. the the recruiting, interviewing, hiring, onboarding, and leadership development of people, which is critical when you're a remote team. And then it also has to be good at, at the managing conflict, managing communication, uh, managing different styles, which again is critical when you're managing teams. And then now because we've all got these companies that are distributed with employees that are in multiple countries, multiple cities, gosh, I had an employee who worked for me for four years and I had no idea what state he lived in in the United States. I had no idea um, because it didn't matter really in a way. It was We were always talking to each other over video. But the second commands have to be very good at those sides of the business where entrepreneurs are often not as good. Often the entrepreneurs are great at the cheerleading, great at raising energy, but they're often bad when the negative stuff has to happen, when the tough discussions, the hard decisions have to be made. Um, you know, the firing of people, that's really when they need the cleanup person because the CEO is often so worried about making sure that people like them, they, they need that counterpart you know, kind of like wait till your dad gets home. Um, <laughs> that's just part of the part of the relationship of the CEO and the COO. Got it. And like, Matt, this, you've got a very impressive track record and, you know, being able to have that saying that you've influenced a lot of these companies and businesses to have, you know, be the best places to work. Where did this first come up for you? Like, when did you know this was what you were meant to be doing? Oh, well, I, I was groomed as an entrepreneur. My father... Uh, had run his own company for years. Both sets of grandparents raised their, ran their own companies. And we were groomed. My brother, my sister, and myself were all groomed to be entrepreneurs at very young ages. My dad had a very strong company culture. He hired misfits. He hired people that wouldn't have been able to get jobs in other places. Hired a lot of people off government work programs. You know, he would have hired the, the Aborigines. He would have hired the the person with the, the physical disability. You know, way before it was normal, he was hiring all of these people half the time because he was getting government grants and could get them cheaper. But then <laughs> he, he got to know them and care for them and like them where they were almost the misfits in the rest of the city. And I think because he cared about them as humans, they went through brick walls for him. And he was a tough entrepreneur. He was, he was pretty bipolar. Uh, he would rant and rave and scream and get pissed off, but they knew that it was coming from the right place. Mm. They knew that it was driving towards his core values or driving towards his vision or driving towards the customer. And because they, he cared about them so much, they decided that it was okay. And I think that was something that I saw at a very early age was that culture. One of my grandparents owned a big hunting and fishing lodge and he had you know, 30 or 40 native Indians working for him, the First Nations. And it was this culture that people loved him and cared for him, but he was all about the customer, you know, all about mm -hmm. caring for the customer as well. So I just kind of grew up in that environment. And they never talked about, you know, meetings and operations and technology. It was always about employees and customers and employees and customers. And from this very caring place, um, that was just kind of the way I was cool. groomed. Sweet. And did you, like, did you go to college? Did you have a gap year? Like, what was that path after? Yeah, I went, I went right um, from high school into college. I ran my own business um, after first year university, started running my own company. I had 12 full-time employees when I was 20 years old. And 20? was running. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, wow, that's epic. Yeah, I started, um, I started painting houses, residential houses and bit small businesses. Yeah, I had 12 full-time employees at 20 years old. Um, I had five of my best friends working for me. And funny, at one point, they thought I was this greedy capitalist who was super rich. And I was like, I'm not even making money yet. Like, I'm literally, with all my paint and insurance and marketing and advertising and legal and fucking accounting and paying you guys and government program shit, like, I was, and it was hard. So I learned about, yeah. open, book, I learned about open book management at 21 years old. That's so funny. Where, where was that? Where, where was that? It was a small town in northern Ontario, about four hours north of Toronto, a place called Sudbury. 
That's so wild. So what like, happened in winter? Like it was like shut down like a hundred thousand people. What's that? What happened in winter? Shut down situation. Yeah, like, winter, you... winter, winter. Where I was just focusing on university, or I would you know get Got back it. into the the recruiting. So I would run the operational side of the company for four months during the summer. And then during the winter, while I was at university, I would be recruiting and marketing and working on the business. That's so funny. That's so yeah. funny. What was, a, what was a key learning you took from that? Because that's pretty impressive. 20 years old, you got like a bunch of employees. What must have shaped you? Um, I guess the key, the key learning was around efficiency, you know, that momentum created momentum, not perfection. Because mm -hmm. there were so many moving parts at such, such a young age where I was dealing with, you know, I was painting six houses on the same day. Right, so we had you know crews of two-person crews, six homes. So so time management, productivity, you know, motivating employees, dealing with customers, dealing with issues as they pop up. Like every home, something would go sideways, and you just had to figure it out. So I learned about momentum, creating momentum, and you know the path of least resistance, and um, just get it done. You know, and problem solving, everything. <laughs> there was so much. Yeah, like, yeah. I bet, to I be bet. running a business at a very young age was was really. A huge growth for me totally yeah and no group chat it wasn't like you're all in the group chat someone's ticking off a box like no Slack or something like that you no it was like... all over it was all over telephone and then uh, we got a fax machine where i could fax my orders into the paint store at 7 a.m in the morning so i would i would get up in the morning i would hand write my there, paint where, store order where was this is this at your parents house you had your own house yeah my parents my there? parents house right. so i would i would wake up in the morning i'd write my order for the paint store i'd fax it in i'd hop in the shower grab my quick shower and they would already have the order. And then I would drive to the paint store, usually pick up donuts and bring it into the paint store. And because I was bringing in donuts, they thought I was amazing. So I'd get better service than all the professionals. Nice. Nice. Yeah, it was just, it was just classic business, right? You just learn all this stuff. That's so funny. Did you, was your dad able to help influence? Like what was his, the family support like? His, the big influence he gave me was on the confidence that I would be successful, the confidence that I would make it go. Um, when I had to sign this 67 page legal agreement, cause it was a franchise that I was getting, I had to, um, I, I, he's like, there's no better time in your life to go bankrupt. Just, just, just do it. So, you know, and then I got a little bit of the startup capital cause I had to buy a, an old van for $1,900 and some old equipment. I think I borrowed from my dad about five or $6,000 to get started. So yeah, there was definitely the, the financial epic. side. <laughs> epic. Okay. And then. You graduated, what happened next? Graduated and I ended up going full time with the organization working on, no way. yeah, there were 60 people at the head office and we would every year have to go out and recruit, hire and train 800 franchisees. And then we'd teach those 800 franchisees in one month to go out and hire 8,000 painters. So I was in the top 60 people of that company for four years, recruiting, interviewing, hiring, training and coaching franchisees. So in four years, I coached 120 entrepreneurs, um, one of whom was Kimball Musk, Elon's brother. So I hired wow. Kimball out of university, third year. And then I also hired his cousin, Peter Reeve, who built Solar City. They were both employees of mine. And so I, I got very good in the early days. This was kind of 1989 to 1993 of coaching and understanding business and dealing with adults running companies and coaching them how to you know, run every aspect of a business way before coaching was a thing. I'd coached 120 entrepreneurs. Wild. So well, that well, was, that was very formative for me. It was a very much a real world MBA. Yeah, definitely. And what were the kind of biggest hurdles that you had to overcome in that, in that process? Well, it was, it was getting results through others. It was realizing that, you know, just being a cheerleader would only go so far that I had yeah. to actually get tactical and give people skills. I became very good at giving people the skills to become better leaders. So training them around things like situational leadership, coaching, delegation, project management, time management, running effective meetings, interviewing. I actually created a course called Invest in Your Leaders, which is all of the content that I used to teach people 30 years ago. And it's stuff that can't be automated. It's stuff that you can't use technology for. It's, yeah. it's all the real world people systems that most people don't spend any time learning. They're also worried about creating a new TikTok video or a new, you know, email list or whatever. They don't even understand how to actually interview and hire and get results through others. Mm -hmm. So I became very good at getting results through others. Mm. And what, when you, was that kind of when you saw the difference between 
but the difference between a leader and a manager? Could you yeah. explain that? Like, it's funny. There's a, there's an old story that we talk about that there's two guys who are both told to clear cut a forest. You know, they're they're both in charge of managing groups of people to cut down all these trees. And the one guy's super efficient, and he's cutting down all the trees, and he's doing a great job clear cutting the forest. And the other guy stops and climbs up the tallest tree and looks around and says, holy shit, we're in the wrong forest. <laughs> Leadership is around vision, and management is around execution. Right. And, and I think there's, the, there's definitely a, a tie between the two, but they're definitely slightly different. Yeah, okay. You know, we also became probably amongst the best in the world at recruiting, interviewing, and hiring, and onboarding of people, because in four months, we had to hire 8,800 people every year. There's not a lot of companies on the planet today that hire 9,000 people a year. Mm. That's a lot. That's a lot. It's like, yeah. how, did you, how did you start to, I guess, influence people in a way that motivated them to work? You know, like there's a difference between, like you said, there's a difference between cheerleading and then getting people to actually do the work because you're not at the house with them, ensuring that they're doing a good quality of work that matches the standard. I started with the saying that money talks, bullshit walks. And so what I recognized was at the end of the day, almost everybody has some economic motivation. So I'll give you the example of Kimball Musk. I, I hire Kimball out of third year university at Queens. He's now going to be running a franchise. I'm training him how to run a franchise. But for me, I want him to do as much revenue as possible because if my 30 franchisees that I'm overseeing do a lot of revenue, then I make bonuses, the company makes more royalties. So how do I make Kimball do more? Mm. I sat down with him and I said, how much money do you want to make this summer? Mm. He said, I don't know, 15,000. And I said, what would your life be like if you made 20? He's like, Pfft. if I made $20,000 in 1993, that's a lot of money back then. That's 30 years ago. 20, that was a lot of money for a university student. 20 grand is a lot of money for a university student to make in a summer today, right? So anyway, I got him to set his goal at 20,000, but he's like, I don't know how to do that. And I said, well, if I showed you how, much, how many clients you needed to do and how much revenue and where to find the clients. So we, we took the profit number and then we backed that into a plan. And then I just helped coach him on executing the plan. But I started nice. with a goal that was his. The goal yeah. was money. How much money does he want to make? So I do kind of the same thing with people today. Where do you want to be in your career? How much money do you want to make in sales? What would you do with that money? What would you do if you had more money? What would your career look like if you were you know, learning? So instead of me saying, you have to learn situational leadership, I show them how learning situational leadership will help them become a better leader or manager in the company. It'll help them progress in their career. It'll help them you know, get more done. It'll help them reduce the amount of hours they have to work. Cause I'm going to pay them a fixed amount of money, regardless of how many hours they work. So I, I kind of game the system in my favor. Now, instead of motivating people, I hire self-motivated people and I find what carrots matter to them. And then I just help reverse engineer that. Mm. Could you talk, maybe expand a little bit on like some questions that you use for people that aren't in a commission base? you know, that are, they're on a fixed income, but we obviously want those people to be really motivated. And sometimes those support roles are so important. Like you never, sometimes if that person leaves, they become so entwined with your life, like an assistant. How do you, how do you find motivating those people and finding that? So again, I, I don't motivate them. I find people that are already motivated. So I will hire people that already have motivation, that already show up in the morning motivated, that already hold themselves accountable. And then I try to point them in the direction of what matters to them. So it might be that a couple of our core values are very meaningful for them. So I show them that how doing their work in a certain way lives their core values. Or I show them that they're going to be getting paid you know, $80,000 a year. And if they can do that $80,000 worth of work in 30 hours or 40 hours or 50 hours, they're still getting paid the 80000 So I show them how becoming more efficient will give them a better life, will mm. ha have more fun, and how it will, it'll, it'll make the work, you know, less stressful for them. So I'm kind of showing them how my systems or my way will be better for them, but, but they already have the motivation for that. I just help point them in the direction of the carrots that matter to them. Yeah, I love that. And do you find, obviously now, you know, you've probably got way more of a knack for it, but 
are there some things that you've done or learnt that have allowed you to see that in an initial interview? Or do you find that like sometimes, you know, there's the old adage, which is like, you know, higher, slow, fire, fast. Like how do you... There's a few parts. Well, there's a, there's a few parts. So we couldn't afford to hire the wrong people because if we hired the wrong people, it would screw up our 17 week business, right? We only mm. could operate college pro painters in this four month period that yeah. we didn't have three months to decide to fire somebody. That was almost the end of the summer. So we had to become very good at recruiting and interviewing and hiring the right people. And then we had to become very good at the training and onboarding and leadership development of those people. And then we had to become very, very good at the coaching and delegation of those people. So no, I, I don't make those mistakes because I put systems in place to save myself from those yes. mistakes. I put the interviewing systems all in my Invest in Your Leaders course, right, mm -hmm. to actually show people how to do that. So you can know, if you look at somebody's resume, I can tell you very quickly whether that person is motivated, whether they're a growth-oriented person, whether they're a team player. If I look at their social media profiles or LinkedIn profiles, I just get to know them. And then in the interviewing process, before I even read their resume, if they send me a resume, I kick it back and say, thanks for your resume. I'm not going to read it yet. Please read this five-page description called our vivid vision of what our company looks like, acts like, and feels like in the future. And then send me a two to three minute video of how you'll help us make our vivid vision come true. If I like your video, I'll read your resume and then we'll bring you in for a group interview. So I don't waste time going through their resume until I see their video. Mm. When I see someone's vid video, I can tell from the tone of their voice, their energy, the way they're showing up, what they're saying, what they're kind of tying into the vivid vision of whether they get it and if they're already excited and inspired. And I've done those kinds of systems for 30 years as well. Exactly, yeah, nice. And then, so you're wrapping up at the painting group 25, 26, like how old were you then? Yeah, I took a year off in the middle, traveled for a year, worked for another company for a year, and then I went back and worked for them for two years. So that took me to 1994. So I was 28, almost 29 when I was leaving that company. And um, I joined a family a friend who was building a chain of auto body collision repair shops. I think you call them crash and dent shops in Australia. And uh, I joined him as his effectively second in command in this auto body franchise. We took it from seven locations to 65 locations in four years, Jeez. took the company public. And right as we were taking the company public, I left that company because I didn't love auto body. They were going in a different trajectory where they were no longer going to be franchising. But I really learned how to take a lot of the skills that I'd done in college pro painters and how to do it with actual adults, like leading 55 <laughs> year olds, leading 60 year olds, leading very blue collar people in business. You know, I got to kind of cut my teeth around that. Um, and then I was hired as the president of a private currency company, kind of what Bitcoin is doing today, but 25 years ago, wow. we got 30,000 companies to buy and sell using a digital currency that we created uh, instead of the US dollar. And we had Starwood Hotels, Avis Rent-A-Car, Budget Rent-A-Car, Hard Rock Cafe, Bose Stereo, all using our digital currency to facilitate multilateral trade. Wow, what happened with that? Uh, that company went public. Um, it's now, it still exists today. Um, I don't think they've executed as well as they could have in the digital world. I think they could have actually played into this kind of crypto world in a much bigger way. but still exists, publicly traded company. It's now called iTex. Wow, crazy. It was, and then it was pretty it... fascinating at understanding how businesses work and operate. Totally. And, you know, I'll give an example. If you're, a, if you're a hotel, right, like the Four Seasons in, you know, Toronto, what's the cost of renting out that hotel room? Well, it's really only the cost of a maid to clean the room and the bottle of shampoo that's in the room. Because the hotel is it's already overhead, it's fixed, it's already there. But the, there's a very small variable cost of maybe $15 to rent the room out. So any room that is not rented at that hotel tonight is expiring inventory. They can never rent that room again. Mm -hmm. So they have a, have a huge incentive to rent that room for anything, for 50 bucks, for 100 bucks, for, right? So what we did is we found people in our community that would pay them a barter dollar to rent the room. And the hotel would then take those barter dollars and they would buy 
advertising or radio advertising or printing or bottled water to put in the rooms or um, coaching services for their team. And they would pay for those services inside of our community with dollars. So that was how it worked. Wow. And, and how do you see kind of hotels going these days? Because it feels well, it's, like... It's, it, this was radio stations, golf courses, car, yeah, like yeah. anyone that had a very low variable cost component to their business um, did very, very well in the, in the barter space. Anyone that had a high variable cost, like if you're making chairs, your cost of goods sold is very high. You don't yeah. do well in that barter community. Got it. Okay. And as far as like what happened, how did you end up at 1-800-GOT-JUNK? Is it really good? Um, left the private currency company when the, the NASDAQ crashed by 78%. This was the, the height of the dot-com area in October of 2000. Stock market crashed. Anyone that was a technology company was getting imploded. We had 900 employees. We laid off 300 of them over the course of about two or three months. And the writing was on the wall that the tech sector was going to be imploding. Uh, so I moved back to Vancouver from Seattle. My best friend had started an auto body, or sorry, uh, a junk removal business. Had, yeah. had 13 employees, was just doing two million in revenue, and he wanted me to coach him and show them how to expand. Uh, they were operating in 12 cities. And I said I would coach him for a few months. And after about a week, his head guy quit because he couldn't do anything I was teaching him how to do. He said, there's no way. Yeah, it was, Jesse, it's amazing. He's like, you, you got to just hire camera, and I can't do this stuff. It's yeah. way over my head. Jesse and I are still friends to this day. And that was yeah. really the turning point where Brian said, could you come in full time and just do it instead of teaching us how to do it? Wow. And then, like, what we was that? You from, just came in as the CEO and then COO and then... Yeah, I came in as his second in command. I was employee number 14. When I left six and a half years later, we had 3,100 employees system-wide. We'd gone from two cities to 330. Uh, we are now operating in four countries, including Australia. <clears throat> and um, we were the number two company in all of Canada to work for. Uh, we had just built this incredible growth engine, went from $2 million to $106 million in revenue. Mm. Uh, but it, was, it got big. It, it was, I was pulling my hair out at that point. It was a very yeah. big, complex, bit, you know, 13 operating P&Ls. Um, and yeah, the, the, the woman who replaced me a year later came in and thought it was a cute little company. She was a former president of Starbucks USA, right? Wow. So she was, she was used to running these big companies. And for me, it, was, it just gotten big. Wow. And how did you, I guess, manage yourself through this growth? Because that's like some pretty, and it seems like you're, you've had a lot of experience going in at a certain point growing really rapidly. Like how yeah. did you learn to manage that scale? Uh, some of it was learning from doing and some of it was learning from some extreme failure. So if I, if I roll back the camera to October of 2000, I was clinically redlining. <clears throat> I'd actually collapsed on the floor of the elevator crying and um, shaking and I was just going through a, an extreme amount of stress. My, just randomly? My mom had, like... Well, my mom was dying of cancer. I just bought my first house. I had just gotten married and realized I wasn't in love. My wife was pregnant. The NASDAQ crashed by 78%. Um, like there was a whole bunch of things happening simultaneously. And I wasn't taking care of myself. I was drinking every day. I was smoking. I was 40 pounds heavier than I am today. Um, I just really wasn't taking care of my, myself and thought I was mm -hmm. because I was able to push through it. But the reality was I wasn't dealing with it very well. So I clinically burned out. Um, when that happened, when that burnout happened, I decided to get my shit together. So through the got junk era, I became healthier. I became more focused on fitness. I started running half marathons. I started to kind of get it together again. Mm. Um, and then I think by having kids as well, I was the first executive in the company to have kids. You know, I was the oldest person in the company, even at, I, gosh, so that was only, I was only 35 and I was the oldest person in the company Wild. at 35. Wild, um, so I think by having kids and, and I started to adapt to that as well, right? You just can't, when you've got two young children, you can't go out and party every night. You can't do, you know, drinks at night. You can't work 70 hour weeks because you're going home yeah. to a wife and children. And so I had to learn to adapt and to get better at delegation and better at saying no and better at yeah. prioritization. 
because you know that was where I was in life. So do you think back <clears throat> like if you'd been spending more time on focusing on your health that you would have been more productive or do you feel like you were able to get so much done because you were just completely obsessively focused and maybe not doing you know learning yeah, about no, and that sort of stuff? Now looking back, I know that I probably could have been more successful had I actually focused on health and balance mm -hmm. and well-being and delegation and getting results through others and not been so radically self-reliant and um, you know able to just push through. So I think mm -hmm. that I was able to now learn that. Now I have the wisdom of, of a few of these cycles and seeing that no, you don't actually work 60, 80 hours a week to be successful. Mm -hmm. You hire people, you delegate more, you train people. So I was coaching someone recently and he said, well, I can't delegate that to my team because nobody can do it except me. And I said, no, delegate it to someone and then give them the skills and the confidence, coach them, take everything off your plate and give mm -hmm. it to people and then coach them. And so I would have become much better at doing that had I not been in that habit of, you know, just work harder, work harder, work faster, work faster. Yeah. And how did you manage, I guess, bad employees throughout that period, of, like throughout this large scaling process? The like, bad employees you... have always been easy for me. You know, when I, again, yeah. when you're 20 years old and you have 12 employees working for you and you have a bad employee, you fire them. So I, in, in fact, when I was 20, I had this guy working for me, Hugh Pasika, and Hugh was a dick. And Hugh was just, you know, I'd love to know what Hugh was doing to this day, but... Every time Shout I would go to, to the every time I'd go to the job site, Hugh was wearing he didn't have a shirt on. You know, he was just like getting a suntan and hanging out and, and I'd be like, You gotta put your shirt on. Workers compensation requires it. You don't look good on the site, like you did, but like you don't. Like you, you need to be look professional. <laughs> Hugh's just the, ripped. He was blind. totally ripped, right? I mean, <laughs> you gotta have the marketing, you gotta have the marketing on the back, but it was really about workers comp and looking professional and, and then also doing what you're told, right? So anyway, anyway, I finally fired him because the day after day, I, I, he'd put his shirt on. I'd come back 20 minutes later with Dairy Queens to say, I'm sorry. And he's got his shirt off again. I'm like, dude, what the fuck? So it was just kind of complete insubordination. Mm -hmm. So I fired him. And that night, this lawyer calls me. And it's, it's his neighbor who happens to be the lawyer for the biggest union in Canada. And the guy says, look, I'm calling on behalf of my neighbor, Hugh Pasika, he says, as a lawyer to a student, I'd like you to reconsider firing him. And I'm like, wait, as a student to a lawyer, he was employed for less than three months. I can fire him for the color of his hair. It's an at work or, um, employment. Like and I kind of just fuck what the lawyer didn't know is I'd been studying law in university and I'd done employment <laughs> law in university, but I had the confidence to know that firing the wrong person, the upside was great because it culturally sent a shot across the bow that every single employee was like, wow, Cameron says what he means and means what he says. We have to listen. He was being a bit of a dick, right? And it shows that he cares about us and he doesn't care about the asshole. So making those tough decisions, firing the wrong employees quickly is the right thing to do. That we should be spending our time with our best employees not spending all of our time and energy with our negative employees. And then all that negative energy that I would have from that, in, that interaction with, with you would spin off into more negative interactions with customers and suppliers and painters. That if I was only hanging out with the good people, like the Joey Prosperies and the you know, Tessarolos, and like all the guys who are fun and good energy, I carried more of that good energy throughout the day. Mm, that's amazing. Yeah, I found it. Yeah, definitely. Sometimes difficult. And especially as like we got more of a, I guess coming to Vancouver was like way more of a PC culture experience and mm. like, you know, needing to go through these processes. Like I had this person who like literally like labeled me as a racist, like all of these sorts of things. And then the company couldn't fire them. And this person was on my sales team. And I was just like trying to like, and I would just like leave this person alone, let them do their thing. Cause I was like, oh my God, this is such a trap. And they just went after me like through and then there was like we got calls from like work safe bc and all this sort of stuff and it was just wild how this one bad apple just decided they wanted to do something and then we couldn't even get rid of them you know right. so every like every really grandmotherism i call them grandmotherisms right every single saying like the one bad apple spoils the whole bunch 
it's very true. Mm. It's like a cultural cancer in your organization. And when, if, if, if you went to a doctor today and said, hey, Josh, <clears throat> you have a cancerous tumor. It's very treatable. No one ever dies of it. How long would you like us to leave that tumor in your body? You're like, get it the fuck out, <laughs> yeah. right? Well, he's already told you no one dies. It's very treatable. You still want that cancerous tumor out of your body. Yeah. If we know we have a cancerous tumor in our company, the cost of that wrong person is 15 times their annual salary. Oh my God. So if you've got a $50,000 person, it's costing you $750,000 a year because of negativity, because of problems, because your good employees think you care more about the shitty employees, because other good employees that won't come work for you because of them, because like there's all these problems and spinoffs that happen. You're better off to just fire the person, maybe even have to pay a fine to fire the person, but you're better off to get them out. Yeah, totally. And how did you learn to manage, I guess, your own life? Like something that I think I've heard you mention is like your, you can't share your life with your employees. Like how did you find the, like you can't air out your dirty laundry to the employees because they have a different perspective of you, you know, as the leader. How did you manage that? And I guess, how do you suggest managing relationships? Because I find, I'll just share a personal experience. It's like, I love my team. And I love spending time with them, but I'm also their leader. And I found in the past, like becoming their friend, you know, not that we don't get along, but like becoming quite close friends with them sometimes changes the dynamic when I have to be the leader and direct. Am I coming out of the from the wrong perspective or? Well, I see, I, I disagree with that. I believe, and I think I believe this more and more than I ever used to believe because of the age that we're in now, mm. there is no professional and personal anymore. Right. Because of social media, we're, we are just out there. Mm. So it's better to just show up as Josh or as mm. Cameron consistently and air our dirty laundry right. and air our personal side and because we're human and they fucking know we're human. So just right. show up and be, our, be ourselves, all of us, but also get to know them. Like mm. really care about their fears care about their dirty laundry, care about their insecurities, care about their worries, care about their struggles as humans. And they'll go through brick walls for us to build the company mm -hmm. because they'll see that we have our shit too, because they already know we have our shit, right? But if we always try to be above them or be a leader to them, they know that we have our shit. So behind the scenes, they're all talking about our shit or mm -hmm. they see our shit on social media. So they know we have our shit. So nice. I think, it's, it, so I, I just grew up that way that I was doing that in 1986. Like there was no, my, my friends were working for me, so they already knew me. My friends were sleeping at my home and painting houses for me. They, we were going out drinking and doing stupid shit together because I was 20 years old that I didn't know how to be a boss to a bunch of friends. So I just fucking held them to core values, held them to the goals. I was firm but fair, but I absolutely, they knew who I was because they were my friends before they started working for me. Right. So I think I think I had a bit of a head start on that. Love that. Yeah, cool. And, and I worked you... I worked behind the scenes with some very very like I coached the CEO of Sprint. You know, Marcelo Claret, who built the right. 82nd largest company in the United States, was a client of mine. I was I stayed at his home. I slept at his home. I've gone to his kids' birthdays. Like I was very inside of Marcelo's personal life with Jordan, his wife, and he didn't ever all of his employees knew that like he, here he is the CEO of a big, big company. And they all knew his struggles with the fact that he was this six foot seven guy who was a little bit too heavy and trying to get back in shape. And they all knew that kids mattered to him, but they also knew that he was a fucking driver, man, like mm -hmm. hardcore. Yeah. So I think, I think when you're just yourself completely at all times, you probably gain more than you lose. That's awesome. Love, thank you for that. How would you have, like, let's say we're managing a team, it's online. Like, I, you know, I get, I'll use an example of my own life. In My life is in Slack or it's on Zoom with the team, right? And so there's a yep. lot of like chit chat and then, you know, Zoom. Sometimes we'll drift off into a more personal conversation and a catch up, but sometimes the meetings are quite scheduled. Would you suggest 
having scheduled just like get to know the team more meetings like how would you suggest doing that when we, we are so remote we're not going to have a chit chat at the office by the water cooler yeah it's really hard because i think we need to find ways to have those chit chats so we need to have time to as you and i started this call we talked about lots of stuff because frankly i'm fucking by myself for three weeks my wife's going through an operation in north america and i can't be back there right now and i'm kind of like feeling a little bit pent up and I haven't been able to talk to humans that like I wanted to just hang out with you as another guy and chat. We need to do that with our employees more. Mm. So we need to actually slow down and connect with all of our employees as humans and recognize that that 10 minutes that we connect with them is probably going to fire them up for the next 40 hours this week. Because a lot of our people might see us for 10 minutes a week. And then they go back to their condo and do their work in whatever random city or country they're in. So our role is to be the chief energizing officer, mm -hmm. right? It's to stir that Kool-Aid and energy up. And it is to connect with them as humans. It's also important to get our employees into communities of places where their peers hang out so they can hang out in spaces with others. So I, I know we talked about this earlier, but I started a community recently called The Ops Spot. So it's yeah. theopsspot.com, and it's a place for operators by operators. So it's anybody who works in operations roles, anybody managing people like managers, directors, and VPs. It's a community for them to hang out with each other without a bunch of entrepreneurs and CEOs around so they can connect and collaborate and chat with each other. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it's important. There's another group called Jam or Work Play Jam, and they run online social events and parties and fun activities for teams and for people. And I think it's important for companies to do, to just get Jam to run some events for you once every two months where you just go and play music bingo or you know adult trivia or family feud and you do these silly games online together and they're just fun. We did a, a global scavenger hunt which was really freaking cool like all online and this company, you pay them like $20 per person and they run this event for you. So oh, I think when you so just, cheaper than I thought. It's oh, cool. it's way cheaper. And when you just, when you just, and what I would do is actually invite a few of your customers and a few of your suppliers, like your lawyer. So I did one recently. I invited my lawyer, my accountant, my financial advisor, and then a bunch of my employees and a few customers. We were fucking laughing. My lawyer is like laughing it up and joking away. And we're like, all we were doing was playing music bingo <laughs> and we were like a bunch of 16 year olds. It's, it's those things that are critically important that we have to build into our day to day. So yeah, plugging in something like work play jam is huge That's so for cool. people. Yeah. Yeah. It's wild. Isn't it? Like you go to a, we just got here like three weeks ago and Bianca, like, you know, found this dude, found a couple of people online. We went to this guy's house and they were like, uh, he was having like a gathering for, you know, new people to Medellin and like a bunch of, you know, people who he'd known for a few years. And it was like within, like you put your name on the board and everyone had to put their name on a whiteboard and we're in this like really big house there's probably like 20 25 people show up and it's like we were playing games within 10 minutes of everyone showing up or like the arrival time and it just broke the ice and it was like everyone immediately just connected and then as soon as the game was over we all had these relationships that had been built around teamwork versus yeah. like 20 people showing up and like one or two people know each other like nobody knows each other we sitting did. around for 30 minutes down hey man where are you from do you how blessing bless you know it's like so just... so we just ran an event recently called the, so I, I run an organization called the coo alliance which is this mm. massive community of second commands from all over the world you know they, they have to do five million in revenue just to qualify so these are real coos of real companies mm. and we had about 50 of us together at an event last april and on the second night we handed out onesies to everybody and we told them they <laughs> They had to wear their animal onesie to dinner and for the rest of the day. And I took all these very like straight laced kind of like very policies, you know, very playbooks and, and you know, and put them into onesies and man, the whole thing just That's changed. Epic. And everybody was laughing and having, and here I am walking around as their leader, as the CEO wearing a unicorn onesie. Mm. Uh, that, that's I love that. because the reality is none of this shit matters, man. We're all going to die. Mm. we're all just walking each other home. And if we try to be something instead of just being us, and I think that's where when we really are us and when we let our employees know us, they're now connected with us, mm. then they're going to work harder for the company. 
And if we as a leader connect more with them, not about the work stuff, but what are they struggling with? How was their weekend really? How is their relationship with their spouse really? How are they doing with their weight gain really? How are their hobbies? Why the fuck aren't they trying to chase down some bucket list item? Mm -hmm. When we care for them as people, they will go through brick walls for us to get all their projects done and work harder and manage their time better because they know that someone actually cares about them. I love that. Yeah, like I really another, appreciate another human, right? A human that they know. Yeah, man, this is that's. I'm really glad that you you know elaborate on that because that's very natural for me. And the last you know, the last startup I was working at, um, I, was, I was very close with the founder, and we had these VAs in Belize. And so I was going through Belize to uh, Nicaragua and then going to come back down to Colombia. And so I was like, sweet, I'm going to go meet the girls. And like went to their hometown, this tiny little country in Belize. I mean, this tiny little town in Belize. And he was so like, he was tripping about the whole thing. He was like, no, that's not what you do with employees. You always have a gap. Like you always have to have this, you know, you can never be too close to them. They'll take advantage of you and da, da, da. And I was like, what the hell? I was like, why? And you know, I built these amazing relationships with them, but it was it's crazy how sometimes we can get a word of advice or influence and it can change the direction of our whole life. You know, I left that relationship thinking that well, I was like, Oh, maybe the way I do things is wrong. You know? Yeah. And I, I think it's when people give us opinions versus experience mm. that can take companies dangerously sideways. So I believe in something called the Gestalt protocol. It's one mm. of the rules for the op spot. It's one of the rules for the CO Alliance is we're not allowed to share our opinion or an idea of what we think someone should do. That is fucking irrelevant. I don't care what you think. I don't care what your opinion is. Tell me what you're doing. Tell me how that's working in your company. Because I guarantee you this person giving that advice has never built one of the best companies to work for, right? Or their employee net promoter score is not above 70 or 80% as an employee NPS. Yeah. Or their Indeed or Glassdoor ratings are not over a 4.5, right? So show me your data, show me your experience, and then, that, then I'll extract from that. So I'll take mm -hmm. one experience from somebody, another experience from somebody, and I call it ideas having sex. That's really where the, the, the big value comes in. Amazing. And what's on your bucket list slash fuck it list? <laughs> and what have you done in the last five years? But I like, love that you, you know about the fuck it list as well. So uh, yeah, so I have a bucket list, which is all the stuff that I want to do before I die. And then I also have the fuck it list, which is the stuff that I'm just not doing anymore. So one of the things that was on my fuck it list a few years ago was I was just not going to drink wine on planes anymore because I really liked wine. And the wine that they served on planes, frankly, was shit. So I'm like, well, I would never buy this shitty wine if I was at home. Why am I drinking it on planes? So I was like, fuck it. I'm not drinking on planes anymore. That actually changed into um, five months ago. Fuck it. I'm just not drinking anymore. So I just wow. kind of quit drinking. It just doesn't serve me. I, mm -hmm. would, I would rather do a microdose of mushrooms or LSD or a macrodose of mushrooms or LSD and enjoy something that, that I can wake up the next day and still go to the gym and you know expand. So I'm, I'm more into working with some psychedelics and working with shaman and working with some expansion that way and just not drinking anymore on my bucket list. I just actually shared it with you in the chat. You're welcome to share it in the show notes. My wife and I share our bucket lists. Oh, there's nice. two tabs. There's two tabs at the bottom. She's koala. I'm cutie. And we both share. There's about 150 things on each of our bucket lists of all the stuff that we want to do or try or experience. Um, over the next bunch of years. And then we also show all the things that we've gotten done. So, you know, th things that I got done over the last couple of years, um, went to Antarctica. I went to Bhutan to go hiking and living in monasteries with the monks. Wow. Um, went hiking in Patagonia. Um, did six weeks going through Italy. Um, it went to Venice. I mean, like a lot of my bucket list stuff has been travel. Uh, skydiving over the palm in Dubai, um, going on safari in Kenya. Dude, um, private jet, 2008. Let's go. Oh, yeah, I did private jet with forever ago. <laughs> yeah, like I've done. Yeah, that was before people were posting photos of it because there was no social media back in 2008. Facebook had only started. <laughs> but yeah, I, I flew in a private jet before anyone would post photos of it. <clears throat> um, yeah, those things, you know, going to Burning Man six times. Um, so, so we're just all about we're all about sharing our bucket lists with people 
and then sharing them with each other and helping each other cross items off of our bucket list. Mm. Okay, so I love this. You've got a remove section down the bottom. Yeah, there's some things where all of a sudden it's like, I don't know, it, it doesn't call me as much anymore. Yeah, right. yeah. I love that, cool. And I saw you've got uh, Ningaloo Reef on here. I'll have to give you some... Uh, that's on my I wife's live... button. So you're looking at my wife's. If you go to oh, the really? very bottom, there's two tabs. Hers is, is Koala. If you go to the right the kit tab beside it, that's oh, QT. mine. That's QT it. is nice. mine. So yeah, you're reading her bucket list. If you click on the yeah. next tab, you'll see my mine. Nice. Dude, this is epic. Oh, Cambodia. Incredible. Yeah, Sweet. we're going to we're going to Laos and Vietnam this year, and that's on our bucket list. Amazing. Dye my hair a crazy color for a festival. Epic. <laughs> I've never done it. I see all these like, is I'm gonna dye my hair like purple or something weird. That's epic. That's so cool. Wicked. And what's been one of your favorites in the last couple of years? Or last and, year? Antarctica for sure. It sounds um, insane. Yeah. Well, and, and for a few reasons. What's so silly, but first, I'd read a book years ago, 30 years ago, called Endurance about Ernest Shackleton and the exploration of Antarctica and his ship crashing and then how these 40 odd guys survived almost two years living on ice floes and islands and living off penguins and seals. And it's mind blowing exploration of how they actually survived this two years and every single guy survived. And it was 100 years ago. So mm -hmm. that book Endurance is, is my favorite book of all time. And it just really inspired me to go and see it. So that was one. Number two was I had been paid to speak on six continents. I've been paid to speak in 28 countries in, in person groups. Mm. And so the seventh continent that I had not been paid to speak on yet was Antarctica. So I had this CEO call me and he say, hey, I'm putting on this event for a bunch of CEOs in Antarctica. Do you want to come? And I said, I'll go <laughs> as long as I can do a paid speaking event while I'm there. He goes, I will totally pay you to speak while you're there. I wanted you to speak. I'm like, dude, what the fuck? So literally in Antarctica, he hands me a check to pay me for speaking to this group of entrepreneurs. So I have literally been paid to speak on every single continent, including Antarctica. Dude, that's so sick. Yeah, so just like stupid <laughs> little things like that, right? And then the other part was, I've never really been that big into like animals and stuff. So seeing penguins, whatever, I'll see penguins. I saw them in New Zealand, I'll see penguins, mm -hmm. whatever, right? But I was like, I hope I see some penguins there. On the second day, as we were driving into this little island by Zodiac boat, the guide, and, and we saw no humans for seven days. We only saw animals. He said, today in front of you, what you see is somewhere between 300 and 400,000 penguins. 350,000 penguins. That's insane. Were, it was, like a, it was like, a, like an, a river of penguins. But when you get onto the island, 300, well, a single penguin shits and pisses. 350,000 <laughs> penguins shit and piss a river of excrement. It is the most disgusting smell I've ever smelled in my entire life. But yeah, hanging, so hanging, out in, hanging out in Antarctica, we did the, the first silent disco in history in Antarctica with a world-class DJ for an hour. <laughs> um, yeah, on the, on the Antarctic shelf. We, we, that night, we all wore penguin onesies on the boat and had a onesie party. It was awesome. It was an epic. That's epic, man. That's yeah, epic. epic trip. Wow. Did you plunge? Did you jump in the water at all? I did. Yeah, I swam yeah, as well. Awesome. Coldest, coldest swim of my life. They tie a rope around your waist in case you um, pass out in the water. Um, and salt water freezes at just below the freezing mark. So, yeah, it was, mm -hmm. it was really freaking cold. Freezing. And you've got yeah. two tattoos now. I have two tattoos now. Where where'd you read that? Yeah, I have two tattoos. I got tattoos on my wrist of my boy's, um, oh, somewhere there, my boy's birthdays. And then I have a tattoo on my shoulder of uh, a koala, which is my nickname for my wife. Nice. Nice. I like that. There's a, a picture you can see me jumping into the water in Antarctica. Oh, dude, epic. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's Freaking so funny. Cold, man. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> And so you're planning to like stop a little bit of the travel because like going through this list, there's like a lot. And what made you decide to be like, we're going digital and doing the nomad style? Um, well, we actually publish our travel calendar as well. I'll drop that into the, into the note Sweet. if anybody wants to catch up with us on the road. We've got our That's next incredible. 16 months of travel already planned out. We're going to slow it down a little bit in that we, um, we're going to try to stay in places a little bit longer. And we're recognizing that 
it's less about going and seeing all of the sites in every place. And it's more mm -hmm. about just immersing ourselves in the culture and getting to know the place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was in Medellin for, in Colombia for, for eight days. I was in hospital for two of them, but, but while I was there, <laughs> I, I only did two little tours and frankly, both the tours were pretty useless. Um, I really enjoyed just wandering around the streets and getting to know the, the neighborhoods and getting to eat the food and getting to watch the locals being locals versus going to every little tourist site. So I think what we're trying to see now is how do we live in some of the cities and countries around the world that we want to be able to live in and, and, and do more, a little bit more of that. Mm. And, and you we're, traveled a fair bit when you were like younger as well. Like, do you think yeah. those were really pivotal in your personal development and learning development? Like, yeah, when I was 25, I did a, um, an 18, 18 country, uh, one year trip. Um, you know, prior to pre-internet, right? So this was doing it all with a, a Lonely Planet book and, and just showing up in a city and asking locals, like, where should I go? What's the best area to go to? And then finding a backpacker's hostel. And then, you know, that one was full and you'd have to walk around, you know, like, yeah, I did it all out of backpacks pre-internet. Wild, wild. And then as far as psychedelics, love mm. to come back to that. When was the first time you did psychedelics? Was it when you were older or younger? No, when I was 20, uh, I guess 20 or 21, I did mushrooms for the first time. And I was like, wow, these are fucking amazing. And I, <laughs> I laughed and laughed and laughed and I just loved the energy. And um, yeah, I just really loved the energy and, and the feeling was incredible. Mm. And then I did a, a couple of doses of LSD at Grateful Dead shows. Didn't really do anything for me. And then it was years, really. It was years and years and years later. Um, and now we're doing stuff with, you know, I've done um, injected ketamine with a doctor, like in the doctor's office, um, you know, with a, you know, an anti-gravity table and a weighted blanket and headphones and deprivation masks. Oh, and that sounds yeah, like, like a loss. <laughs> no, because you're doing, a, we're doing a full on journey. So you go in totally, with intentions totally. and you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they're, they're dosing you perfectly. So you have the absolute perfect experience. Wow. So I'm, I'm probably doing a little bit more of that than I am. You know, we're, we're just booked a seven day um, in Costa Rica to go and do ayahuasca and we'll do five nights of ayahuasca. Uh, but again, we're doing it in professional settings with professional yeah, yeah, shaman. What so was doing a little bit more of that. Like? Pardon me? What was that ketamine experience like? No, oh, fucking unbelievable. It was like talking to God. It was, I've done it twice with the same doctor in Scottsdale, Arizona. It is literally like death you know you're dead, you know you're talking to God, you know you see this energy, you know that nothing exists and it's all just been energy connected. You realize that everything is so massively connected. For the next six weeks afterwards, it's just bliss. Like you just, Crazy. everything in the world is just fucking okay. Like it's just all mm. good. It's great. Yeah, it's wild, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. it's like, it feels like there's another, like when I did mushrooms for the first time, it was like, it like you get this, I guess, lens taken off. Yeah. And then it doesn't go all the way back. And yeah. you just it, like, that's one of my favorite things was like, you get to see, even though it's like comes back a little bit, obviously you're not seeing things maybe in like, you know, super HD or the colors and stuff like that. But it's like, there's still like cracks in the lens. Yeah. And it's, 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 it it's, it's impossible to explain to someone what doing psychedelics properly is like. It's almost like explaining what your dream was to someone the mm. night before. Yeah. You can never, like, you ever try to explain your dream? You start laughing, going, oh, fuck it. It was just really good. <laughs> because you realize you can't explain it all because it's so 3D and there's so many colors and yeah. so many things happening in your dream. But I think people have to be careful with, with doing them for the wrong reasons as well. I also mm -hmm. find that, that a microdose of LSD or a microdose of psilocybin can be very, very powerful in getting work done, in actually being very, very productive. Um, mm. And you know, where, where you and I both used to live in British Columbia, all drugs have now been decriminalized. You can get magic mushrooms delivered to your door. Is it the in, bicycle monkey? Is that how you use it or what? I don't remember what it's called. There, there's a, <laughs> it's I think like Pure, a... the company in Got Vancouver, it. but they literally deliver bottles, capsuled with labels. Yeah. You know, it's, it's all dosed out perfectly because they realize that they want to actually control it and do it and clean. But yeah, we're trying to do it more with shaman and doctors than, you mm -hmm. know, doing it in party settings. Yeah. How did it influence your um, spirituality, if at all? Like I've got no context of you, what your religion or spirituality is, but did it 
change that at all? I had already left the church. I was part of the Roman Catholic Church growing up and, and had um, didn't love the experience. I was an altar boy for years and just never loved the guilt and the pressure. I liked mm. the feelings around core values and community, I think, and being a good person. I think what psychedelics has probably shown me is just how we are all truly connected, which I never got that from the church at all. Mm -hmm. I, how we are this tapped into this energy and how I feel energy and see energy and communicate energy, which I never got from the church at all. So I think, yeah, the spiritual, spiritual component to it has just been around this connection of energy. I absolutely feel that. Um, yeah. The very first book I ever read around this kind of stuff was called The Celestine Prophecy that I read 30 years ago. And The Celestine Prophecy talks about seeing energy in nature and then the connection, and then recognizing um, that things happen for a reason. That, that there's no such thing as coincidence. Like, it's no coincidence that you and I are talking today after both being in Medellin a week ago. There's something around, you know, there's no coincidence that you know the Ingala Reef, which is on my wife's bucket list, because it's on the west coast of Australia, and most people only talk about the Great Barrier Reef, which is dying, and it's on the east coast. Like. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in coincidences anymore. I believe that things happen because energy is connecting us in the right way for the right reasons. Mm. Would you mind, you know, speaking of serendipity and connection, would you mind retelling the story that you told me at the start of the show? Which one? The one about your... Um, my brother? Your brother who met the lady in Perth. and. So my brother Todd, 1990, he's 23 years old decides to go backpacking around the world <clears throat> with his buddy, Tim. They meet up with a guy in San Francisco who's from Australia. He says, if you're ever in Australia, come look us up. And they're like, fuck, we'll never be in Australia, but whatever, thanks for the invite. He goes, yeah, but if you are, my parents own a hotel on the ocean in Perth. You can get a job there. We'll find you a place to stay. They're like, yeah, we'll never be over in Perth, but thanks for the invite. A week later, they look at each other and you know what? US sucks, let's get the hell out of the US. Let's take all of our extra cash we have left. Let's go to Australia. Let's get a job when we're there. We'll just bum around, backpack, work in wherever. And when we're ready to come home, mom and dad will pay for our flights and we'll come home. So off they go. They travel kind of a little bit of Australia. They go out to Perth, which is a long way. I mean, Perth is like a long the way from everywhere, man. It's the most remote city in the world. Yeah, it's like, it's like a five-day drive from Sydney. <laughs> it's like a, a five-hour flight from Sydney. Anyway, they get to Perth. They, they go to this guy's parents' hotel. It's called the OBH, the Ocean Beach Hotel in, in Perth, Australia, and turns out this guy, David Quinlivan, his parents do actually own the hotel in Perth. They do actually give Todd and Tim a room at the hotel. They do give them jobs as busboys or waiters or whatever at the hotel. And then a couple days later, they're out on, on his aunt's sailboat, David Quinlivan's aunt's sailboat, and they're sailing around Rot's Nest. And she says to my brother, where are you from? And he goes, oh, a small town in Canada. And she goes, what's it called? He goes, you, you wouldn't know it. It's a small town. And she goes, no, what's it called? He goes, it's called Sudbury. It's like four hours north of Toronto. And she goes, wow. She goes, 20 years ago, I was in Sudbury with a woman that I used to travel with, like you're traveling with my nephew. I traveled for six months with this woman. Would you happen to know a woman named Jane Shorts? And my brother starts laughing and goes, that's my aunt. <laughs> this woman had traveled around the world with my aunt 20 years before, and he's traveling with her nephew. She goes, come to my home tomorrow. I want to show you something. So Todd goes to her home for dinner. She pulls out a photo album, opens up this photo album, and there is a photo of her standing on my parents' back deck. And she says to my brother, do you recognize this? He goes, yeah, that's my Aunt Jane, and that must be you standing on my parents' back deck, and you're holding a three-year-old little boy. You're holding me. That's so crazy. So these coincidences, so of course, when I went to Australia two years later, I went yeah. and met David Quinlivan and you know, like you have to go, you just trust these things happen for a reason, right? You can't mm. figure out why did it happen. It's just the world is connected. We are all, and it's why I believe that as leaders, we have to care about our employees' humanity more than we care about our company. Mm. If we care about them as people, truly care, they'll care about our company. It's yeah. why we also have to put our employees into communities like the Op Spot, why we have to get our COO into communities like the CO Alliance, why we as entrepreneurs have to be in parts of mastermind communities. We have to stay connected in this very disconnected world and not just connecting via technology, but really connecting at a deep human level with people. Mm, definitely. Yeah, man. 
Uh, I'd love to know, just as we wrap up, like what's something you're really looking forward to coming up in the next 12 months? I know you've got a big bucket list, but kind of what's something that you're stoked about? I've got a, there's a three day festival that we're going to in Austin, Texas with a bunch of friends. Um, it's a small festival. It's only going to be probably 150 people, but it's going to be nice. this pretty epic, super fun DJs, parties, dancing, onesies. I'm really looking forward to that, to just disconnecting. Uh, I'm looking forward to going to a Halloween party in, in uh, Utah, in Eden, Utah, again with another huge group of entrepreneurs and hanging out with friends. We've got some good friend time coming up in, in mm. um, November, so I'm really looking forward to that. A great wedding in Austin. So I'm really looking forward to like a month of really connecting with friends because we've been on the road for you know two and a bit years and we have had lots of time away from friends. So it's going to be a really fun month to, to really connect. That's epic. That's epic. And is there a way that you like to treat yourself? Like maybe there's a certain block of chocolate type of coffee. You know, you said you don't drink anymore. So is there something that you have or do that is... Um... I, go for, I go for massages frequently. So today I'm, I'm, I finish my calls at about 12.30 today. I'm going to go to the gym and get a workout in and then I'm going to a massage after that. And then I come back and pack up everything. So yeah, I'd say massages are good. Definitely love chocolate. Chocolate is definitely right up there. Oof. Dark yeah, chocolate, you, sea yeah. salt, caramel, yeah. Oh, the caramel, dude! I'm a big, I'm a big chocolate fan. Yeah. I'll tell you, if you're in Costa Rica and you yeah. see any Nicaraguan chocolate, dude, Nicaraguan chocolate, I'm it's telling good, you, good, eh? Like, okay, it's the good stuff. I will Thanks, do man. it. Thanks, man. Appreciate amazing. it, Josh.